Well, hello, hello. Hey, you are watching the No Brainers Empowering Possibilities show. And this is dialogues of encouragement with fresh perspectives, invitations to ahas, a little bit of science, a dash of behavioral psychology, and a whole lot of creative fun. So if leveling up is on your radar, my friend, you are at the right show. In fact, today we plan on having a lot of fun. I'm your host, Roseanne Marsh. I'm the author of the Teen and Parent Empowerment Curriculum Level Up. And you are listening to episode number three, why the creative in you is wanting to be unleashed and who is she? So are you ready? Let's dive into this week's episode. You know, to hear the word creator can be a little bit intimidating for some. It might sound like we literally have to construct something from scratch or we have to deliberate over some art piece that others can admire. Or maybe we even have to orchestrate a Broadway play. And yes, those are products of creators. But what runs through your head when I say, unleash the creator inside of you? So be thinking about that for a minute. Do you think, oh no, no, one more thing on my plate, not one more to do, really? Do I have a creator inside of me? And after all, you know, I'm very analytical and I lead with my left brain. I mean, I like order and function and math and structure and to create, that almost gives me hives. Or do you think, wahoo, <laughs> I love creating. I'm all about unleashing anything that has to do with creating. So bring it on. Well, today's episode, we're going to reveal what a creative really is and why the creative in you is wanting to be unleashed and what flavor of creator you are. Yep, there's a flavor to it. And as a bonus, we have a fun little exercise to coax out the creator in you and find out what flavor you are. So years ago, uh, Tanner Christensen had published an article on creators and I loved what he said. So I've kind of extrapolated out 11 different things that he describes as a creator. So as you listen to these things, just place it on your fingers. Like which one is like, yeah, I resonate with that. I resonate with that. And I resonate with that. So here you go. Here they are. Number one, being creative means solving a problem in a new way. Okay. Is that you? Two, it means changing your perspective. Three, being creative means taking risks and ignoring doubt and facing fears. Number four, it means breaking with routine and doing something different for the sake of just doing something different. <laughs> Have you ever done that before? Gone, gone to work a different way. Number five, it means mapping out a thousand different routes to be able to reach one destination. Number six, it means challenging yourself every single day. Number seven, being creative means searching for inspiration in even the most mundane places. Number eight, it means you're asking stupid questions and asking lots of questions. Number nine, it means creating without critiquing. Ooh, that's a good one. Number 10, being creative means you know how to find similarities and differences between two completely random ideas. And number 11, being creative means you're thinking. So now that you've heard these explanations, isn't that a little bit easier to say, oh, you know what? I have a lot of creator inside of me. So what are the advantages of being a creator? Well, instead of just talking about it, I want to share with you an experience I had when I ran into an old documentary about a year ago, and I found that it was not only riveting, but it was so timely. So it was about a part of a foreign country that I had the privilege to live in a number of years ago, about for four years. And although I know a lot about the country, there was a story behind a story that I did not know that blew me away. And so as you listen to this story, pay attention to what the advantages are of being a creative. So this took place in AD 400 to 500. So four or 500 years after, after Christ. And, and then there was an area of the North in the Adriatic Sea. If you can see where my pointer is right now. 
And it was very fertile, is right up in this area. You can see the Adriatic Sea comes up through here. And there was a lot of marauders that were coming down and vandals coming down through this section on their way to Rome, because of course, Rome was under attack and they were trying to take down Rome. Well, this was a fertile area and there was lots of farmland and the troops would, uh, from attacking countries would come right through that area. And they would pillage, they rape, they murder. Now, the only other way they could come was over here through the Alps. Well, that was hard and continuous to go through the mountain. So of course they traipsed right through the farmland and the farmers had to flee for their life. If, if they didn't want to die, they had to go and they would flee, but they would lose all what they had as the armies and the thugs would come through. And then a lot of the armies would stay and like the area and take up homestead. Well, the only place for them to flee was into the marshlands that were created by the sea in this little area right here. They were small, muddy islands, too wet to sustain a building, but they had boats so they could flee in. And the persecution got worse and worse. And this was the time of when uh, Attila the Hun, if you remember, was uh, attacking. He was like the third force that had come through. And so they found more and more, these Venetians, that they needed to stay longer and longer. It's formidable. They couldn't grow anything and they couldn't build anything. So no, they did. They started to get creative and imagine how could they make this habitable? Well, they weren't followed into the marshes by the invaders, so they knew that they had to stay out there. So they had to find ways to strengthen and drain, enlarge, and protect the area of these sandy marshes. So they needed to build a foundation, but metal would rust. And at that time, you have to remember, everything was made out of beautiful stone and marble. But stone and marble was too heavy, it would sink. So they came up with wood pylons. And they found a certain marble that the seawater would not eat, but they would create these wooden pylons. They would drive them down until they hit clay. And then when the wood was stacked so close together, it would petrify. And then they'd put this marble on top of it. Then there, but there was no way for them to produce food and they needed food. So they got creative again and they started to uh, pan out all the salt water, dry it out, and they produce salt. And they started selling it all over. They became powerful traders in Europe. They became so wealthy. In fact, let me show you a couple of different things. They had to do all these pylons by hand. Look at this is an actual photograph of around the 18, the 800s AD. But in 832, 1190 years ago, they built a basilica and it took them seven years to build it. But then 200, about 225 years later, they had to rebuild it. It took them 36 years to rebuild it. But they built what had never been done before. They had to put in 1 million pylons by hand. Today, there's over 10 million wood pylons in Venice. It's made up of 118 um, came the greatest traders, shipbuilders, and seamen. They created their own democracy. They created a health care. And in fact, it was this, this democracy and this health care that was later adopted by the United States. So the Roman Empire was crumbling. The Venetians formed um, a republic. It became so powerful that they owned a lot of Greece and, and the coastal area. And so they were protected from attacks because they didn't need walls to defend the towers. Invading armies would need to have boats to reach them. And much like castles that had moats to protect them, this city had an entire lagoon protecting it. So at first they opened up their trade to salt and then the spice trade down here in uh, India, they owned a lot of this area. So a lot of countries couldn't go that direction. And they had, um, they, they had made these deals with India. So uh, Spain and Portugal who wanted to get into spice trading had to go all the way around Africa just to get to India. <laughs> and okay, this is, in, this is so cool. 
because they had to go all the way around, guess what happened one day? I uh, got lost and found the Americas. Okay, how cool is that? That's for another a lesson. But they started out, it started out being a place for refugees. They escaped for fear and protection, but they reimagined and recreated the ground they lived on. They reimagined and recreated transportation. No horses, no cars, just boats. They reimagined and recreated their government. They reimagined and recreated how to make money. And they became one of the most wealthy and powerful uh, countries or entities. They attracted musicians and artists, and it became one of the most beautiful cities around. So when great things have to be done to protect civilization, great things can be achieved. Is that not the most amazing story of taking something that was a setback and with your creativity, creating something that was unimaginable? Well, I gave you 11 definitions of a creator at the very beginning, but now I wanna share my definition of what a creator is. And I feel it can be encapsulated in this definition. Awaken the child within you. <laughs> Unleash that five-year-old. What am I talking about? I love that, that um, five-year-olds do one of the coolest things. And that is they use their imagination and their creativity. Think about it. When we were five, we were aware of the world and had enough exposure of the world to know what we liked. But I tell you, there are five things I absolutely love about five-year-olds. And I want to tell you about what those are. First of all, five-year-olds, they are present in the moment. Their head is not worrying about the future and they're not worried about the past. Think about five-year-olds. They are present and they're living and loving the present. Okay, sometimes they have meltdowns and stuff, but they're living and loving the present. They're curious and they ask lots of questions, right? <laughs> As moms, don't we know? Question, question, question. Why, mom, why, mom, why, my mom? Do you, did you ever have to answer any of those? So they're, they have this curiosity. They daydream. Think about the role of dolls and toys and the role playing that we did, the role playing that you see kids doing. I remember that my mom would throw us a blanket and a flashlight and we'd make forts out of a couple chairs and we would reimagine and play and daydream and jump on the mantle and sing to the record player. Okay, that's dating me, but we would daydream. Another thing I love about five-year-olds is they're resourceful. They, if they know that there's cookies on top of the refrigerator, they, um, they do whatever they need to do to be able to get out of, to get that cook, those cookies off the refrigerator. They are resourceful. I remember we wanted to talk to each other when we were kids and we were in separate rooms. So we would talk through the heater vents late at night or in the middle of the night, thinking our parents couldn't see us or, or hear us. Literally, I mean, they had the vent in their room and they were listening to the conversation all night long. But we were resourceful. Since we couldn't get out of bed and go talk to each other, we just used a heat vent. So, and the fifth thing I love about a five-year-old is they have no preconceived limits. My parents would give me, give us uh, what I felt like was the best present. And that was when they would bring home a refrigerator box, <laughs> an empty refrigerator box, because it could be unlimited things. I remember it started out as like a rocket ship and we would uh, sit in there and have space control, different commands and uh, talk to mission, the mission control and where we were going, which planets we were landing on. And then when we got tired of that, we turned it on its side long ways and cut some windows and doors. And all of a sudden it became a home with a trap door in it, or it became a submarine. And then when it thing, that thing was absolutely thrashed at the very last moment, we would ride it down the stairs of the basement. I mean, I'm amazed that we never cracked our head open, but there were no limits to what we could do with a cardboard box. You know, 
do five-year-olds now do this? Do kids now do this? Hopefully they do. But what were the results? What are the results and the outcomes of unleashing that five-year-old creator that's in, in, within us? What are the advantages of releasing that five-year-old? What are the disadvantages if we don't unleash that five-year-old in us? Now think about Venice. What would happen to Venice if they had never created Venice, the Venetians? What would happen to their civilization? Where would they have gone? They would have been completely annihilated. Their genealogy would have been gone had they not used the creativity and thought outside the box. So to me, the secret is letting the five-year-old out. It's about curiosity. It's about imagination. So are you guys ready to play with me for a minute? I did uh, let you know that what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to type in there for me. And I know there's a little bit of delay for those of you who are live. I'd love you to participate with me. So are you guys ready to play for a second? Let's have some fun. I'm going to bring up a picture. And what I want you to do is I want you to immediately start typing what you could use this for. Okay, so are you ready? Here is your picture. Oops. Here's your picture. This is an empty ketchup bottle. So go. Let's start writing in some responses. What could you use an empty ketchup bottle for? I'm gonna take off share so I can, a bowling pin, excellent. A siren, ooh, good. Let's see if I can see the rest of the chat. A lotion bottle. A tower. Good. Okay. Those of you who are watching this um, show or this episode after it has aired live, what are you thinking? A tunnel. Good. Okay. Now I want you to think again. I'm going to show it to you one more time. This time, I want you to think like you're a five-year-old. And what could you use this? as a five-year-old. What would a five-year-old say this empty ketchup bottle can be used as? Ready, go. You are now five years old. You're a kid. What can you use this ke empty ketchup bottle for? Okay, let's see what we've got here. It could be used as a torpedo. It could be used as a water gun. <laughs> I know some of you are already thinking as, an, of, of, as a five-year-old with your first ones. What else? What else could a five-year-old do with an empty, empty uh, bottle? It could be a baseball bat. There are so many ways that we can use things and so many different things that we can come up with when we start thinking like a five-year-old, when we start thinking like a kid, because sometimes we, uh, uh, as old as we are, whatever age we are, we start to limit the possibilities of what things can be. Try that with your family. Uh, have them do that. An empty ketchup bottle. Okay. So, okay, now that I, um, for those of you just that are joining us live, the second half is where we start trying some tools. So we share our experiences and we learn together. So if you're watching the replay of this, try to catch this show live so that you can be part of the community, the like-minded women, so that you can add your experience. 
So we are going to be doing some fun things in the second half hour. But now I want to talk about when we talk about who is she, who is that creative? I really feel like there's four flavors of a creative. And I call them flavors because these are words that I have come up with. What do I mean? Are What kind of creative are you? Are you a sleeper, a keeper, a seeker, or a peeker? And you may be thinking, what in the world are you talking about? Well, let's talk a little bit about those four. So are you a sleeper, a keeper, a seeker, or a peeker? So let's start out with the first one. And these are my take on creatives. The first one is a sleeper. As a sleeper, do you go to bed and do you dream of solutions? Do you meditate? Do you take, take some time to be still and to imagine and let your mind dream? Do you get still and visualize? Do you take quiet time to ponder and listen and seek for answers? Do you try to get direction that's out of the box? In fact, I heard the other day, the surest way to think out of the box is to just get rid of the box entirely. So one of the ways that we can be a creative, and as you listen to these, you may be all of these, or you may be one of them. But as we add a little bit of all of those in, we become more powerful creators. So the second one is, are you a keeper? Do you collect good ideas like in a notebook or in, uh, do you write down ideas as they come to you? Even like in your phone, do you think, uh, do you write jot down thoughts or questions that come to you? Inspiration in a journal, um, motivational things that you hear, good ideas. Are you a keeper of good ideas? I went to an exhibition of, the, um, of Leonardo da Vinci years ago, and I got to see the notebooks that he kept. And these were totally fascinating because he kept a notebook with him all the time. And he was curious about everything. Every single day when he got up, he wrote a question that he wanted to have answered. So one of the questions that he would ask himself would be like, why do fish swim faster in water than birds fly in the air when water is heavier? It's like, well, I wouldn't have even thought of that. Or describe the tongue of a woodpecker. Or why is the, the sky blue? Those are pretty deep thoughts. But every single day he challenged himself to learn something new. And then he kept all of that information in these priceless notebooks that we, you can now see, you can actually look them up online and see the actual pages and the inventions that he came up with. When we have a way to write things down, we don't lose that spur of the moment, creative spurt or idea or impression that comes to us. Okay, the next one would be then, are you a seeker? As a seeker, do you look for how others found solutions and then use it as a model as how you can use that in your life. Do you look at history and do you see patterns in history? Do you stretch your knowledge of something that comes into your radar? Do you go, oh, whoa, that, that just came across my radar. Um, I'm gonna delve into that. That's this, um, the story of Venice and the impetus behind building that came onto my radar one day and I went to the History Channel and I, I ordered the History Channel specifically so that I could learn about Venice. So are you a seeker? Do you, um, do you learn from other people? Do you find people that are aligned to what you're interested in and try to get information from them? So the last one is, are you a peeker? <laughs> You're like, what is a peeker? Peeker, do you peek at something from one angle, then go around and look at it from another angle or another side? And do you look at things from lots of different ways? You know, what comes to my mind is, remember the story of the elephant and the blind man? 
when um, each one of the blind men were led to led to an elephant and the elephant was something different for each one of them. One had the tail, one had the leg, one had the trunk, one had something different. And each one of them spoke uh, from their experience, like, no, the elephant's a rope. No, the elephant's a, tr a tree trunk. No, the elephant's a snake. No, the elephant is a big floppy piece of something. Or as a peeker, do you try to find the different angles to be able to align yourself to what your real, what the real truth for you is. Do you play devil's advocate to expand your own understanding? And do you pay attention to things that cross your path? Like what catches your eyes? What shapes do you see when you're someplace? And are they symbolic of something? What animals or insects cross your path? Do you look up their significance? In a future episode, I'll be talking about finding the messages that are all around it. And it's extraordinary because when we not seek for signs, but when we, when something draws our attention, when we pay attention to it, it's, it's amazing the message that it has for us. And as creatives, we pay attention to those things that pull or draw our attention. So when you look back on all of these, types of creatives are you a sleeper do you meditate do you dream do you visualize to get inspiration are you a keeper do you write things down and record so that later you can go back i cannot believe just in my phone the things that i have just impressions that have come that are priceless that i go back and go oh that's right now i remember when that happened are you a seeker? Do you seek out information or others? Do you see those patterns? And are you a peeker? Do you look at things from different ways? And are you observant to be able to look at life through a different pair of eyes and learn from it? And most importantly is, do you know how to get your five alive? Can you reawaken that five-year-old and use the imagination and the creativity? And remember, imagination is up here and creativity is bringing it down in the here and now. Now, the episode before, I gave you five steps for creation. And this kind of dovetails in with this episode. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that, I invite you to go back. So my invitation this week is pick several suggestions. We have... Um, uh, we have discussed today to unleash the creator in you. Use your, using your mind, imagination, creativity, and thinking is a muscle that as we use it in a productive way, it gets stronger. The world we live in today is because someone else dared to imagine, think, and create. Our lives are enhanced, they're enriched, and sometimes our survival is going to depend on our problem-solving skills. So open up that creative curiosity and move into a world without constraint. Keep your five alive. So does the world need you as a creator? Yes, the world does need the genius that only you can be as a creator. And creators are the problem solvers of the world. It's not just right brain or left brain, it's both. Where a creator can see when one door closes, they see three or four others that they can go through. So we're told that we're uh, that to be right brained is creative side and left brain is analytical. Not necessarily so, but are you curious to know which one you lead out on? If you are, go to nobrainers.com in the top menu. You can look for brain quiz to find out if you lead with the right or the left, or if you're whole brain. So if you're curious, go there. So if you enjoyed this episode, I'd love you to share and spread the word. And thank you for sharing this half hour with me. And remember, tools don't need to be complicated or hard. Many of them are just no brainers. So we'll see you next time, my friend. And remember, we're all creators. So let's go out and create. <laughs>